All right, um, my paper's a bit long, so I'll just get to it. The very recent publication of Jacques Derrida's newly discovered Geschlecht 3 is bound to have a lasting impact on the way we think about the relation between deconstruction and Heidegger's thought. Scholars have long argued that this is a complicated relation indeed. Heidegger is by far Derrida's most privileged interlocutor throughout his deconstructed reading of the history of Western philosophy, a pride of place that is marked by an ambivalence well captured in French by the phrase tout contre Heidegger, right up against Heidegger. Even if Deida himself never thought of this against in the mood of criticism, so that he can say in Geschlecht 2 that he never simply criticizes Heidegger, je ne critique jamais Heidegger, it nevertheless seems quite plausible to argue that the name Heidegger tends to signal a place of contention and dispute in Deida a site of struggle where a confrontation, an Auseinandersetzung, we might say, between Derrida and Heidegger each time ensues without any clear victor in the end. For Derrida, to read Heidegger is thus to have it out, s'expliquer avec, the philosopher he once characterized, perhaps only half-joking, as, quote, the philosopher's hell. Nowhere more than in Geschlecht 3 does this complex and tumultuous relationship become so explicit. Deida is in fact so close to Heidegger that at in Geschlecht 3 that at times it becomes difficult, if not impossible, to sort out the authorial voices in the text so that one no longer knows in whose name a given passage speaks. Many times throughout Geschlecht 3, it certainly looks as though Deida were merely doubling Heidegger, particularly when describing how Heidegger is himself doubling his own description of Trakos poetry. Today, I would like to call attention to this irreducible and uncanny element of doubling in the Hidas Geschlecht 3, a motif that permeates the whole of the Hidas thinking in general and his reading of Heidegger in particular. My suggestion will be that the Hidas repetition of Heidegger, which in and of itself is already a certain doubling of Heidegger's Viterorum, in no way commits Dehida to a position of passive commentary or ad nauseum exegesis, a point that Dehida will make explicit in his reading of Heidegger in Geschlecht 3, where the very concept of reading is itself problematized. Geschlecht 3 enacts Dehida's reading of Heidegger in ways that help us think about what it means to read, in the strong sense of that word, a praxis perhaps forgotten in many philosophical circles today. Part 1. Dehida's Quasi method, part one, they does quasi methodology in Geschlecht. Though Geschlecht 3 has only recently been discovered, a quote, very brief outline, six pages in fact, of it exists at the very ending of Geschlecht 2, where they does summarizes Geschlecht 3's principal concern into five foci, one of which deals more specifically with the manner in which Heidegger reads Kako in his essay in On the Way to Language, titled Language and the Poem, a placement of Georg Kako's poem. Immediately before his discussion of the five foci, excuse me, Deida begins to problematize the, quote, concept of reading, which, unless thoroughly reformulated, seems to him inadequate to describe what Heidegger is doing to Tako or what he himself is doing to Heidegger, for that matter. Deida points out that one of the five foci he's about to list deals explicitly with this concept of reading, which suggests that this concept is itself implicated in and by the Geschlecht problematic in Geschlecht 3, the very beginning of which confirms precisely this point. Quote, No doubt will I try to relate modestly several readings of Geschlecht, of Geschlecht to one another, leaving a dotted line of so many other possible itineraries. But the word reading also lets itself be affected by this resituation of Geschlecht. We cannot then rely on any easy assurance when it comes to this word. Dehita goes on to reflect on how this simple usage of the word reading, of how his simple usage of the word reading already, quote, implicitly banks on conventions and complicities, which, in this context, it would be imprudent to rely on, given that the Geschlecht problematic in Heidegger just might affect the word reading by precisely dismantling the metaphysical foundations of the said conventional theory of reading that would then be inadequate, inadequate 
vis-à-vis the insights of Heidegger's thinking of Geschlecht. In other words, reading needs to take into account how Heidegger's remarks on Geschlecht end up being, if only indirectly, significant for the concept of reading itself, which would then be determined from within this problematic rather than artificially imposed on it from the outside. The question would then be, how exactly does the Geschlecht problematic in Heidegger relate to reading? And just how exactly might it denounce the metaphysical unfounded prejudices of a conventional theory of reading? These questions are left unanswered by Dehida's outline of Geschlecht 3 at the end of Geschlecht 2. Even though the outline's third focal point does broach the methodological or, quote, beyond methodological question of reading, without, however, making explicit what the internal relation between reading and Geschlecht might be. The newly discovered Geschlecht 3 begins by at least trying to sketch an answer to this question, which will deal not just with how Heidegger reads Tackel, but also with how Dehida himself reads Heidegger, and with how we, too, are in turn trying to read Dehida's reading of Heidegger's reading. Before turning to Geschlecht 3 itself, let us dwell just a little longer on the aforementioned focal point, quote, where several questions of method intersect, as Dehida is trying, without banking naively on the very methodologism that Heidegger warns us against, to understand how Heidegger reads, nevertheless. So here's Dehida. What is Heidegger doing? How does he operate? And along what paths? Hodoi, which are not yet or already no longer methods. What is Heidegger's step on this path? What is his rhythm in this text that explicitly pronounces itself on the essence of Hutmos? And also, what is his manner, his handwerk of writing? These questions beyond method, d'autre méthode, are also questions about the relation that this Heidegger text and the text I am writing in turn entertains with what is called hermeneutics, interpretation, ex or exegesis, literary criticism, rhetoric or poetics, but also with all the bodies of knowledge of the human or social sciences, history, psychoanalysis, sociology, politology, etc. Deida is implicitly referring to the three-page introduction to Heidegger's language in the poem, where Heidegger more explicitly speaks about what he's doing to Paco <coughs> right at the start of his essay, Heidegger insists that his placement, his autumn of Tracho's poem, will have already gone a long way toward accomplishing what it set out to do if it modestly contents itself with two preliminary steps towards indicating and paying heed to the place he ought once every individual Tracho poem springs and towards which it flows and points back in a back and forth manner that corresponds to the essence of what, quote, aesthetical metaphysical representation of thinking only superficially deems rhythm to be. In his essay, Heidegger concedes that this way of proceeding may well appear one-sided to the disciplines we just saw that he done mentioned, and whose method in no way resembles the path, the vague, along which Heidegger wants to think. A hodos or ievig, or ievig that in fact seems to lead nowhere as far as the human and social sciences are concerned. Dehida begins Geschlecht 3 by reading Heidegger's three-page introduction, practically line by line, explicitly impressed by the rigor of Heidegger's gesture, which will preemptively retaliate against the objections of the metaphysical methodologism of the human and social sciences by means of a, quote, clause of modesty, which turns out to be an authoritative verdict, as Dehida argues. Here's a passage Dehida is thinking of, where Heidegger, quote, dismisses the human and social sciences at the threshold of the situation, naming psychoanalysis, something he rarely does, alongside history, sociology, end quote. So here's the passage that he was thinking of from Heidegger's essay. The placement speaks of Georg Tarko only in such a way that it pays heed to the place of his poem. Such a way of proceeding remains blatantly one-sided, if not wayward, Iavik, for the age that has a historiographical, biographical, psychoanalytic, and sociological fascination with naked expression. The placement pays heat to the place. If we look carefully at the first 20 pages of Geschlecht 3, we can see how Dehida is doing all he can to give Heidegger his due. 
by noticing how traditional methodology banks naively on the very problematic presuppositions Heidegger's thought goes a long way to deconstruct, data highlights how Heidegger remains immune to the ammunition of traditional criticism that cannot begin to understand the questions Heidegger is asking, let alone pose them. The suggestion seems to be that if we are to have access to the presuppositions which may problematically, quote, uphold such a situation of Tacos Gedicht by Heidegger, we had better first make sure not to give in to the very presuppositions Heidegger warns us against time and again, especially those having to do with, quote, the metaphysical project of method, as Dahida explains. Here's Dahida. We are still in the introduction, even before the beginning of the first part. At the threshold, the precautions multiply. Others would call them methodological. In fact, they warn us against method and methodologism, not in the name of empiricism, but quite the contrary, in the name of a rigorous path towards the place. This path, which is not yet a methodical procedure, will no doubt seem arbitrary, capricious, and committed to improvisation as long as, it, as, long as we do not situate, as Heidegger so often does elsewhere, metaphys the metaphysical project of method itself. Dahika goes on to notice how Heidegger's, quote, pre- or a-methodological precautions quite powerfully wrench his discourse from the domain of, quote, all the discourses and the whole body of knowledge that make use of method, as Heidegger will rigorously, quote, forbid himself, and us in turn, when reading him, from metaphysically relying on the facileness of traditional methodology, which is then unable to go beyond or behind its own problematic foundations, as Heidegger is wont to do. It is precisely this pre- or a-methodological prohibition that should, according to Derrida, give us pause when reading Heidegger, and hastening to criticize him by tacitly or unwittingly drawing from the very resources Heidegger's thought so thoroughly problematizes and, quote, so often situates, as Derrida says. This is why Derrida will specify in Gishlash 3 that Given how Heidegger's thorough dismantling of the prejudices and assumptions of traditional methodology will void all its resources and recourses in advance, it is as though we were, from the outset, destituted of the entire strategic apparatus of a classical theory of reading, being unable to mobilize its methods and use its ammunition against Heidegger, who will have always remained immune to accusations that do no more than strengthen and confirm his own position. Quote, here we are then, incredibly disarmed and without recourse. Nous voilà donc bien démunis et sans recours, writes Derrida, so as to surrender to Heidegger in a certain way, willing to be vulnerable to Heidegger, which, paradoxically perhaps, helps Derrida not to fall prey to a certain, quote, imperturbable irony, the most discreet and surest irony that will always be on Heidegger's side, end quote, as long as we keep using conceptual weapons and deploying tactics that cannot but declare victory to Heidegger from the start. That he that thus begins his reading, it has, now by, it has by now become clear, we do not yet know what this word means, of Heidegger in Geschlecht 3, by trying to give an account of the peculiar methodological impasse that haunts the reader of Heidegger it being understood that method is precisely what is being problematized in Dehida's introductory remarks, and in Heidegger's own introduction as well, that we more cautiously could call quasi-methodological, or pre- or a-methodological, as Dehida himself does, when describing the rigorous precautions Heidegger and he himself must take at the opening of their respective Dimash. The main thrust of Geschlecht III's opening pages seems to lie in noticing just how difficult, if not impossible, it is to uncover the potentially problematic foundations on which Heidegger's reading of Tracho rests, a possibility that can only be opened up, so it seems, via a problematization of the concept of reading itself, which begins in Derrida, and in Heidegger as well, by means of a powerful and almost paralyzing bracketing of all the assurances that traditional methodology has to offer us. This is why Derrida starts his reading of Heidegger by first, quote, taking into account how Heidegger's self-presentation of how he reads 
and of how he in turn needs to be read according to the Hida, falls outside. So how Heidegger's self-presentation falls outside the domain of the aforementioned classical methodological questions of reading, which subsequently leads the Hida to give two examples of, quote, what the classical, two examples of, quote, what the classical forms of these questions presuppose, neglect, or dissimulate, end quote. Let me turn to these examples that will begin to make clear how exactly reading and the Geschlecht problematic in Heidegger go hand in hand, or, as the Hida says, how exactly reading, quote, lets itself be affected by this resituation of Geschlecht. Part two, the topotypology of Geschlecht. For the sake of time, and perhaps for psychoanalytic reasons, I will not be saying much about the first example that Heidegger gives, and that touches on Heidegger's sword, or penetrating spear point, which as lie, lacking, and wink, a wink and clin d'oeil malin, cannot resist interpreting as the phallus, a transcendental signifier which would support every signifying chain as the place, le lieu, of the signifier, as Lacan says. So this is the part of my paper that I had to cut, or perhaps castrate. Suffice it to point to the general thrust of Dehida's first example of what the traditional methodology of the human and social sciences, psychoanalysis included, quote, presupposes, neglects, or dissimulates when reading Heidegger, which I take to be this. Traditional methodology takes for granted the textuality of the very text he claims to read never pausing over, quote, that singular place that a textual locality is. That is to say, never thinking through what constitutes this textual locality in the first place, a place that Heidegger, quote, proposes from the outset to rethink in the aforementioned Hako essay, as the word autohom in that essay's subtitle already points to the ought, the place, of Hako's poetry that Heidegger is trying to situate without naively relying as the social and human sciences are wont to do, on an uncritically inherited common notion of what textual place means, which, incidentally, is precisely the Cartesian notion of space as, quote, the geometric space of the res extensa, or even of being as Vorhandenheit in general, end quote, that none better than Heidegger precisely so powerfully and repeatedly dismantles throughout his thinking. This naive and unquestioned topology would thus be the first example of what a classical theory of reading, the methodology of the human and social sciences, presupposes, neglects, or dissimulates when dealing with Heidegger. That he does thought here seems to be that Heidegger's ironic smirk, that, quote, imperturbable irony, the most discreet and surest irony, end quote, is not perturbed in the slightest when those making fun of him, the Lacanian ironists, for example, do not realize that the joke is actually on them for blindly presuming to know what the very same Heidegger says they do not, namely the topology on which any concept of reading relies, whether implicitly or explicitly. Whereas Heidegger's first example of a presupposition made by human or social scientists when trying to read Heidegger exhibits an, an admittedly indirect relation to the concept of reading itself, or even the Geschlecht problematic as such, given that Heidegger's thinking of Geschlecht in the Traco essay implies a topology that seems more concerned to rethink place in general rather than textual place in particular. Heidegger never explicitly says, I am thinking textual place. He says, I'm thinking place in general. And given that Heidegger refers to, quote, the topology of being elsewhere without having to mention the word Geschlecht. Whereas then, Dehida's first example exhibits an admittedly indirect relation to the concept of reading itself, or even the Geschlecht problematic as such. His second example is more explicitly to do with how the concept of reading lets itself be affected by this resituation of Geschlecht in Heidegger's essay on Traco. In addition to banking naively on an unquestioned textual topology, the methodology of the human or social sciences will uncritically, will uncritically will uncritically rely on a typology this time, a thought of the type, which is at the heart of the very word Geschlecht. As Dehida points out, what ties the type to Geschlecht is the German word Schlag, meaning strike, hit, blow, imprint, or type, which are themselves the meanings 
of the Greek words tuktein and tupos, and that is inscribed or typed into geslecht, whose etymological ancestors geslet and gislati are the collective forms still preserved in the ge prefix of geslecht of the old high German slati, from which schlag and schlagen are derived. This then authorizes Dehida to treat Heidegger's word on geslecht as words on the type, or the schlag, a, quote, type of thought that presents itself as a thought of the type, end quote, of the blow, hit, imprint, or strike of the schlag of geschlecht, which leads Dehida to think of this type as a kind of writing, without which no concept of reading would be possible, as he puts it. So here's the second example. Second example, second preliminary indication, the concept of reading. Let us recall this triviality. Whatever its re-elaboration may be, the concept of reading is never constructed without that of a writing. That writing which gives us reading, or gives itself to be read, qui se donne à lire, or which engages itself at the heart of reading itself. No reading without mark, trace, impression, inscription, incision, strike. Now, we will come to this. This pathway towards a locality passes necessarily by way of a thinking of geschlecht as a thinking of the strike, the schlag and of repetition, of the redouble strike of the good and the bad strike." End quote. Throughout Geschlecht, Rita Hida calls attention to the highly problematic status of this repetition in Heidegger's reading of Taco, which, quote, remains more platonic and Christian than it seems, despite Heidegger's incessant protest to the contrary. In other words, Heidegger's differentiation between a right strike and Hechta Schlag in an evil one amounts to an inherently platonic understanding of writing, according to which an evil bad strike which Heidegger literally associates with the Greek word plague, meaning plague, curse, or malediction, comes to repeat the good one, making Heidegger at once recognize the inevitable possibility of this fatal accident and wish it were not so. In a sense, all that Heidegger is doing in Geschlecht 3 is to put pressure on what he calls, quote, the grand logic of philosophy Heidegger seems to buy into when establishing a platonical Christian setup that, quote, supposes the exteriority between essence and accident, pure and impure, proper and improper, good and evil, end quote. Dehida's point here is not to insist on how a bad repetitive strike might always affect and corrupt Geschlecht in the manner of some terrible accident it would have been best to avoid, as Heidegger's axiomatics seems to commit him to wanting to save the Geschlecht from this corrupting force of evil. Rather, that he is simply trying to point out that if this fatal accident is able to happen to Geschlecht, then it must be because the structure of Geschlecht, or, quote, the structure of that to which this can happen is such that this can happen to it. Which means that if an accident can contaminate the pure essence of Geschlecht, then it must be because, thinks Dehida, quote, that essence is a priori accidented. L'essence est a priori accidenté and that Geschlecht is infected with dissension and discord from the start, which leads Dehida to think of this accident no longer as a simple evil, but as the condition, both of possibility and impossibility, of that completely unified Geschlecht that Heidegger hears in the Ein of Trakos Ein Geschlecht. All this to, ind to indicate briefly the way in which Heidegger's essay on Trako articulates via the distinction between right and evil strike, a platonical Christian typology or understanding of writing which will directly affect the concept of reading, which, as Dehida points out, a triviality, as he calls it, always emerges by way of a particular understanding of type qua writing, or of, or of writing qua type. However, this is not the only type of typological presupposition the human or social sciences make when reading Heidegger. Even more generally than the particular typology thematized by Heidegger's essay, Heidegger's own, Heidegger's own type of writing, which itself emerges from within this particular typology, Heidegger's own type of writing, or type of reading, how Heidegger describes what he's doing to Trakow, how he reads Trakow in some Heidegger's, quote, self-presentation or signature, and, quote, 
a signature is always of a type, as the Hidai reminds us. Heidegger's self-presentation is something that a classical theory of reading or traditional methodology cannot read precisely, which is why the Hidai will try his best to understand what is at stake in the way Heidegger signs his essay on Traco, a text that the Hidai described as being essentially, or, quote, in short, Heidegger's signature, imprint, or strike. And I was, as I will suggest in closing, there might be a difference between the way Heidegger says he reads Traco and the way he actually does so, the latter being something like, quote, a writing extravagance, une extravagance d'écriture, as Dehida calls it. Right at the outset of Geschlecht III, Dehida is committed to showing how, quote, a typology is implicated by the set of, by the set of classical questions dealing with the manner in which Heidegger reads Traco. As he explains, these traditional questions of method necessarily rely on the regularity of a law that allows Heidegger's typical gestures to be, first of all, identified as a signature or as the trade mark that gives a Heidegger text its distinct and unique character, what Dehida calls, quote, a type of Heideggerian reading, or its type-like path, le cheminement typé, that thinks insofar as it leaves a mark behind, an imprint, quote, trace, impression, inscription, incision, blow, the type or schlag of Geschlecht, that make it possible for traditional methodology to ask the how does Heidegger read question, even as it is unable to consider the typology implied by Heidegger's signature that makes this question possible in the first place. What well, that seems to interest Dehida the most, as he says, is his reading, in his reading of Heidegger in Geschlecht three is precisely Heidegger's signature, which, as Dehida says, is of a type. It would then seem like a typology of sorts is what allows Dehida to ask how about Heidegger's manner of reading, and in turn about his own manner of reading Heidegger, without buying into the presuppositions that these methodological questions tend to make concerning the very concept of type on which the corollary, the corollary concept of reading depends. The thought here seems to be that, given how decisive the concept of type is for any re-elaboration of the concept of reading, a text giving to read a thought of the type can no longer be read according to an old model of reading that never took into account the type of text it wished to read. And incidentally, what this very type of text might explicitly say regarding the notion of type itself. Which explains that he does concern to begin his reading of Heidegger in Geschlecht III by emphasizing what type of methodological, philosophical classification Heidegger's typical gesture, or his self-presentation, falls outside of. Here's the Hida. How does Heidegger read? How does he write? What are the movements by which we recognize his mark? Interpretation, hermeneutics, poetics, philology, literary criticism or theory? Clearly not. Heidegger's typical gesture does not present itself under any of these headings, and it is necessary at least to begin by taking the self-presentation into account, whatever conclusions one may draw from it in the end." end quote. This extreme difficulty in thinning Heidegger's signature down, strictly speaking, we cannot even call philosophy what Heidegger is doing to Traco, as Deida points out, inspires one last quasi-methodological precaution on Deida's part. If we are first to decipher Heidegger's Schlag, and then perhaps see what is potentially problematic about it, we had better first make sure not to submit Heidegger's signature to, quote, the transcendental, epistemological, or methodological protocols of a hypothetical general theory of reading and writing that skips over Heidegger's type of thought and thought of the type. Let us now turn to Dehida's efforts to characterize, to characterize Heidegger's and his own type of reading. As we shall see, after having taken pains to be as cautious as possible, Dehida is now in a position from which to read Heidegger in a manner that just might wipe his ironic smile off his face. Part three, writing on Heidegger, overprinting in Dehida's Geschlecht III. After pointing out how traditional methodology fails to ask the topotypological questions Heidegger's thought of Geschlecht is opening up, 
Teida then proposes his own description of what he would mean to follow Heidegger. Quote, with the least possible reservation. Avec le moins de réserve possible. A task that paradoxically does not commit his démarche to, quote, docile or passive commentary, as he explains. Quote, this is Derrida, trying to follow Heidegger in this path of thought with the greatest possible patience and prudence, but also following him with the least possible reservation. This does not commit the démarche to the genre of docile or passive commentary. Rather, this requires that, without, however, being overly hasty, se presser, to object, we press, on press, the text to read questions in as much as possible, preferably questions that apparently do not appear in it as such. Tahita then goes on to characterize the manner in which he reads Heidegger, Heidegger's signature, imprint, or strike, with, a very help, uh, with the help of the very schlag he is trying to read. Here, Tehida mobilizes the typographical language of the printing press, whose type imprint, schlag, becomes a sort of lever that helps Tehida understand what he's doing to Heidegger, and what Heidegger, a little in spite of himself, is doing to Trakl. In other words, the very text being read provides the semantic and conceptual apparatus that sheds light on how this very text may be read vis-a-vis -vis the typological thematic that the Hida is then trying to read in a typological manner that is itself inscribed or typed into the very text on into this very text on type. The Hida pursues the thought that a deconstructive reading does not supervene on the text he reads from the outside. Rather, deconstruction is always already happening to and within a text, even if what is deconstructive about it be relegated to quote, questions that apparently do not appear in it as such. That is, questions that the text tends to repress or evade unless it be pressed to do otherwise, as Dehida suggests. Quote, still in the same paragraph, to press questions, presser des questions, even if that is done without polemic precipitation. That is, that is already to imprint another text, to cross the marks of multiple writings and languages, to make repetition into overprinting. Sur impression. There are, this is still Dehida, there are at least two ways of writing on a text in order to let it appear. One way consists in refraining oneself from every mark or remark, from every writing intrusion that would risk covering over or disfiguring what should precisely appear alone, intact, naked. The other way consists in dot, dot, dot. That's the part of the so does the TypeScript page abruptly break off here, leading us to wonder what this other manner of writing on or reading a text would entail, particularly when the text in question thematizes the notion of type, which, as we saw data argue, is decisive for the concept of reading itself. Here, we may turn to the very beginning of Geschlecht 3, where data offers a couple of remarks when trying to answer the question already posed at the beginning of Geschlecht 3's brief outline in Geschlecht 2. How are we going to read this text? Though the outline does not really take on this question, Geschlecht 3 opens with Dehida's attempt at an answer which would have in principle communicated with the aforementioned second way to read or write on Heidegger, or write on a Heidegger text. So this is, I think, the very beginning of Geschlecht 3. Quote, our progression is going to be slow, irregular in its rhythm, following an itinerary no linear representation could describe. is insane progression, already going too far, about an approach that may give the feeling, annoying to some, that it lets it itself be paralyzed by its very insistence. We're not advancing, we're turning in circles, we are backtracking. Apparently without gaining any ground, without occupying any position, renouncing every concern for discursive strategy. And then, all of a sudden, abrupt jumps, leaps, zigzags, decided each time, and we do not know whether the singular ruptures have been carefully calculated or if they have surprised the discourse, come to it as the event of the other, decided from the other." End quote. What is striking here is that what is initially pitched as Dehida's manner of reading a Heidegger text ends up being Dehida's description of, a, of how Heidegger himself reads. 
quote, it is first of all Heidegger's manner that we describe in this way, end quote, says the Hida immediately after the quote above, suggesting an element of doubling that will indeed prove to be an irreducible aspect of the Hida's thought in general and of his reading of Heidegger in Geschlechtstein in particular. As we shall see, this doubling is itself doubled up. As the Hida perceptively notices, just as Heidegger is speaking of himself when speaking of another, in this case, Taco Stranger, he, Dahida, is too speaking of himself when speaking of Heidegger, which means he's doubling an already doubled up situation, which is then redoubled by our own attempt to situate it in a turn. This means on a beam according to which one is always already speaking of oneself when speaking of another, slides the discourse into an autobiographical zone where signatures cross and countersign each other, generating effects of overprinting, sur impression, that will make it difficult, if not at times impossible, to sort out the authorial, vo the authorial voices in the text, whose very surface of legibility becomes superimposed, sur imprimé, with layers that one can no longer sift through or confidently keep apart. For our purposes, this means that we do not and cannot always know who is speaking under whose name, and who is reading who in Geschlecht 3, a text which will always say more and less than one voice at once. Let us insist on this doubling a little further. Just after having switched the discourse from self-description into the characterization of Heidegger's manner, which entails, as we saw, an irregular rhythm that goes sometimes too slow and sometimes too fast, Dahida will again switch registers, coming back to the question of how he reads Heidegger in a manner that apparently mirrors Heidegger's own backtracking and, quote, sudden abrupt jumps, leaps, and zigzags when reading Taco. Here's Dahida. In order to read Heidegger, to follow him without barbaric violence, without unjust or unfaithful violence, in order to hear him without walling oneself up in the deaf passivity of commentary, must we not simultaneously regulate our steps with his and deregulate them? Must we not disturb their cadence, slow down when he goes too fast, interrupt the jump, suspend his gesture, or instead leap all at once toward a given detour at the turning point of a long procedure? The obvious paradox here is that even when he slows Heidegger down or jumps ahead of him, Dehida could be said to be still following Heidegger in not exactly following him, by reading Heidegger in what is here explicitly called a Heideggerian manner, which seems to entail a certain faithfulness to Heidegger that does not amount to the death passivity of commentary, as the Hida suggests. To follow Heidegger with the least possible reservation, in a manner that is itself Heideggerian, does not complete, completely eliminate the violence that Hida inflicts on Heidegger, even if this violence is more just and faithful than barbaric, as he says. To read Heidegger in a Heideggerian way is thus Dehida's way of repeating Heidegger by, quote, imprinting over Heidegger his own mark, a kind of blow or strike, a schlag, that will definitely leave a scar behind. <coughs> how exactly then does, how exactly then does Dehida wound Heidegger in Geschlecht 3? This question points us again in the direction of what he means to read Heidegger, that is, his signature, or the way Heidegger speaks of himself when speaking of Taco, an autobiographical dimension of Heidegger's text, which seems to have, quote, most interested Dehida in Geschlecht 3. Here's Dehida. In fact, I place in this excursus what most interests me, perhaps, in the reading of this text. What does Heidegger do? Which movement? Which path? Which madness, which sense or other sense does he describe? What and whom does he speak about in this supposed situation of Kakos Gedicht? Take a good look. He is speaking, I will not say of him, Martin Heidegger, but certainly of his own course. Heidegger is reading and writing on the trace of Kakos' place. He is speaking of himself in speaking of the other. He is speaking of his own place in speaking of the other's place. Or rather, he is in search of his place in following the steps of the other." End quote. Dehida goes on to call Heidegger's essay on Krakow a text, quote, which, in short, is Heidegger's signature, imprint, or strike, end quote, insisting on marking the, quote, 
seen according to which Heidegger speaks of his own signature. It would then seem like Dehida is trying to read places where he finds Heidegger adopting as his own his description of Taco's poetry, both in terms of its form and content. Let us now turn, in conclusion, to what is problematic about Heidegger's signature. This will entail a bracketing of all the assurances traditional methodology has to offer us when reading Heidegger's signature, a methodological safety, safety that actually blocks our access to what is really problematic about Heidegger's topos and type, a topotypological situation that none better than Heidegger precisely helps us consider and deconstruct. Right at the first page of Geschlecht 3, Dehida begins to allude to the narratological doublings in Heidegger's text that most interests him in Geschlecht 3. The question, of rhythm, the question of rhythm, as he points out, becomes complicated because what Heidegger says about the essence of rhythm in Tracco's poetry can be, quote, folded back on Heidegger's writing. And, as we saw, Dehida's own. The passage from Heidegger's Tracco essay that Dehida has in mind does, in fact, mention a thinking of rhythm that goes beyond the aesthetical metaphysical representation or mere semblance of its true essence, which Heidegger thinks he is thus describing. Here's Heidegger. The poem, Gedich of a poem, remains unspoken. None of the individual poems, none of the Dichtungen, not even their sum, say everything. However, each poem, each Dichtung, speaks from out of the whole of one poem and says it every time. From the place of the poem springs the wave that each time moves the saying as a poetizing saying. However, so little does the wave abandon the place of the poem that its springing rather lets every movement of saying flow back to the ever more veiled origin. The place of the poem shelters as the source of the moving wave, the veiled essence of what can initially appear as rhythm to aesthetical metaphysical representational thinking. The major distinction Heidegger sets up here centers around the spoken or written forms, the centers around the spoken or written poems, Dichtungen, that Heidegger thinks Taco, like every great poet, composes solely from out of a single poem, the one Gedicht that remains silent, but from out of which a moving wave, a bewegende Vaga, springs and poetically moves the saying of each individual poem that will each time point and flow back to the source whence it sprang. This back and forth movement is how Heidegger describes what we might provisionally call the form of Taco's poetry, though Heidegger certainly would not, no doubt on account of his suspicion, which incidentally also applies to the word rhythm, vis-a-vis -vis the technical language of a science of rhetoric he often associated with the aforementioned aesthetical, metaphysical, representational thinking. What, quote, gets complicated here is that Heidegger goes on to set up another fundamental distinction that will mirror the first one, folding back what he says about the rhythm between Tacos, Gedicht, and Dichtungen on his description of his own Demarche, which will then rely on a periodical, on a periodical reciprocal relationship, a vexed bezug, between what Heidegger calls placement and elucidation, the two poles of Heidegger's second distinction that correspond to the terms of this first one. Here's Heidegger. Because the singular poem remains unspoken, we can situate its place only insofar as we try pointing to it by starting from what is spoken in individual poems. However, this already requires an elucidation for each individual poem. We can easily see that a correct elucidation already presupposes a placement, end quote. Dehita seems to take issue with what he calls the, quote, order of implications. Heidegger's manners of reading of Taco presupposes an order that he finds suspiciously close to the hermeneutical circle and its classic form. Even if Heidegger should not use the word circle, but the aforementioned Wechsel Bezug, which for the Hida, quote, <coughs> seems to amount to the same, as he calls attention to the circularity that the motif of rhythm and of source both imply. What troubles the Hida here is that Heidegger has to posit a singular and indivisible place, the Gedicht whence Tacos Dichtungen spring and flow back towards, that will dictate the rhythm, not just of Tacos poetry, but also of Heidegger's supposed correct reading of that poetry. As Dehida puts it, 
without a preliminary access to the singular and indivisible place, to the purity of the idiom, we could not begin to elucidate the poetic texts. Their wave proceeds, and this is rhythm itself, from the wave which will give rise to them. The occurrence of the poem would be unthinkable otherwise. The individual poem only takes place from out of the place which gives rise to it and towards which it in turn points back. There must be convertibility or reversibility between a autohome and a autohome. <coughs> we have here a rhythm, and we could say that poetic rhythm, understood in its proper essence, dictates the rhythm of a correct reading. It should be a faithful to this alliance, to this incessant exchange between the two, a autohome and a autohome. This would then be the manner in which Heidegger reads the rhythm of his correct rechte reading, which will always have presupposed the place, the tip of the sword, that gathers all taco poems into their source. Dehida will emphasize that the privilege Heidegger grants this value of gathering and the indivisible unicity of this one single poem or place will guide Heidegger's reading in a problematic way that communicates with the politically troubling manner in which Heidegger doubles the content, and not just the form, of Taco's poetry, to which I, in closing, now turn. It would be <coughs> beyond of my talk here today to point out all the subtle and intricate ways in which Heidegger ends up endorsing or signing off his own description of the content of Taco's poetry. Suffice it to tease out one instance of it that also speaks indirectly about Heidegger's rhythm, the steps he must take when trying to read and follow Taco's poetry, a point of access to which Heidegger seems to find in the following verse, cited nine times throughout the essay from Taco's poem, The Soul's Springtime. The verse is, the soul is something strange upon the earth, is this die Seele ein fremdes Affärm? Heidegger's first order of business is to distance his interpretation of the verse from a platonic reading which would posit the soul as something strange or foreign upon the earth, in the sense that the soul, being immortal and supersensuous, is really not at home, as it is stuck in the perishable and sensuous earth, a way out of which Taco's verse and poem would then be trying to find, if read platonically, a reading Heidegger thinks he can avoid by displacing the current meaning of fremd, strange, a German word meaning strange or foreign, into what this word authentically means, as far as Heidegger is concerned. So here's Heidegger. What does strange mean? One habitually understands by strange, what does strange, was heißt fremd? One habitually understands by strange that which is non-familiar and does not address us, that which is rather cumbersome and unsettling to us. However, strange, <coughs> fremd, Old High German from authentically means ahead towards elsewhere, on the way to, towards what has been held in store in advance. End quote. As Dehita points out, Heidegger's gesture is shot through with a curious doubling on which Dehita thinks, quote, necessary to insist. As Heidegger displaces the ordinary meaning of hen into its authentic Old High German etymological ancestor, Fram, he winds up enacting on the very word fremd, the very meaning this word comes to have, by means of his appropriation that claims to displace the meaning of fremd into its proper one, into its proper meaning, which itself will have described and meant precisely this very movement towards the proper, as Heidegger tells us. The foreign, here's Heidegger, the foreign, das fremde, wanders ahead. However, it does not roam about cluelessly bereft of every determination. The foreign goes in search of the place where it can abide as a wanderer. Hardly <coughs> disclosed to itself, the foreign already follows the call to the way towards its proper. What Dehita finds particularly peculiar here, what Dehita finds peculiar here is that Heidegger's semantic displacement arrives at a new proper meaning which itself retroactively describes the very process by which Heidegger arrives at this new meaning. Just as friend now means to be, quote, already following the call to the way towards its proper, the word friend itself, ever after having become estranged from its proper meaning, was also, quote, brought back home to its proper, its proper meaning of hum, an operation that describes thus. 
So here's the Hida. On the basis of the old High German Pham, to which we return as though in the direction of a proper of language, the semantics of stranger is profoundly displaced. It's profoundly displaced in the sense of what precisely answers the call that brings it back to its proper, its home, its proper destination. This displacement that affects in language what language will have spoken about, this return to the proper destined by a call, has then diverted us from the current meaning of stranger in our Latin languages as well as in current German. The current meaning became estranged from the meaning of fremd, from its proper meaning. End quote. This narratological doubling, according to which Heidegger speaks of, or narrates, what he himself is doing when reading The Stranger in Trakos poetry, allows the Hidat to transfer onto Heidegger what Heidegger says about Trakos Stranger. Just as Heidegger gives them The Stranger a precise destination, he, Heidegger, will too make his way towards this very specific destination, which he calls us mortals, to pursue as well. Quote, so that we may learn again how to dwell in language, like Heidegger presumably has, in what Dehida calls, quote, only one language or a certain state of language, the authentic and proper old High German source from which, quote, our Latin languages as well as current German are estranged and denied access to, as Dehida remarks how translation then seems a priori illegitimate in this irreducibly idiomatic situation. <clears throat> This untranslatability of secret of a secret and pure German, and Germany as a place of dwelling, most Germans never heard of, brings us back to the sine qua non of Heidegger's Otto, that is, the purity of the idiom, as the indivisible and singular place, the ought, that gathers all poems in advance and allows Heidegger to jump from one verse to from one verse and poem to the next, in a manner traditional methodology is too quick to dismiss. As Dehida notices, Heidegger takes pains to justify the order of his Demash, which, though he may well give the impression of being arbitrary, just like Trakel's stranger only seemed to roam about cluelessly, Heidegger says this Demash is actually guided, delighted, by the aim to bring our attention to the place of the poem almost by way of an eye leap, by way of an poem. No doubt the same leap that Taco Stranger is always already making towards the proper and original Ursprünglich, meaning of Old High German. Just as each Taco poem, according, <coughs> according to Heidegger, of course, points to the poem's one place, Heidegger too wishes to indicate the place by running through a provisional elucidation of certain poems which all resonate with one another by virtue of a tonic or a fundamental tone, a Grundton, that silently permeates each of Trakos' poems and accords a singular harmony and an einzigartig and einklang between them. It is precisely the silent unison that gathers, again, Trakos' poems into their idiomatic source, which, though silent or unspoken, it is not something other, Veda says, than the written or spoken poems it gives rise to, which leads him to see how the silent tonic of the poem's place is, quote, essentially affiliated, in its very silence, to the German idiom that is Old High German. This will in turn lead Dehida to argue that Heidegger is nationalistically endowing Germany and German with, quote, an absolute privilege with respect to language and place, which will lead the human soul towards its proper home. No wonder, then, Heidegger should want to see this irreducibly German silence sheltered in Trakel's phrase, Ein Geschlecht the tonic which will have fundamentally attuned Heidegger's precursory listening and guided his choice of poems, as Dehida argues. Here's Dehida. We remember that it is this fundamental tone, it is, the very, it is its very unity that Heidegger wants to make us hear in the Ein, underlying, betont, of Ein Geschlecht. We can now say, in his Gespräch with Trakel, Heidegger lets himself be oriented by the hearing or the precursory listening of this Ein in Ein Geschlecht. Such will have been the place. It will guide him in his choice of poems or particular verses in various poems, riddling the path with holes, setting up obstacles, preparing the call and the jumping off point for each poem, for each of the leaps, giving the movement for all the metonymic transitions. Heidegger knows that these choices will seem arbitrary or capricious, willkürlich, to those who speak in the name of competency or method, 
only because they have no concern for or even no idea of place, end quote. What Derrida means by metonymy transition here refers to Heidegger's practice of gliding from poem to poem by means of an interseeing password that allows Heidegger, in a manner that he calls brutal and fast, to rely on the mere presence of a word a co or cognate in a poem as the basis of an answer to the question posed by another poem where that same word or cognate occurred. Deida is careful here not to say Heidegger is simply wrong when metonymically transitioning from poem to poem in a manner traditional method methodology would chide him for, as Deida points out, quote, the so-called experts, philologists, philosophers, and poeticians criticize Heidegger for saying just about anything and for not saying just about anything. That is, for either for arbitrarily jumping from poem to poem without taking account of the internal organization and context of each poem, or for imposing on Tackle's poetry a heavily predetermined situation that will make Tackle say whatever Heidegger wants him to say. Dehida's point here seems not to want to side with the criticism of methodologism, but to point out that Heidegger's Dimash is actually more radical and erratic than his own description of it, which cannot explain the metonymic substitution, as Dehida puts it. So here's Dehida commenting on, a, on, a, on one particular metonymic uh, transition. He says, quote, I'm not saying this is wrong, but that there is a metonymy here which is not explained in the sense of eloiterum, of elucidation, end quote. In other words, Heidegger's concept of eloiterum, the first provisional read-through of a poem, or its explication of the text, that which is supposed to bring the pure, the limpid, the clear, the lauterum of each individual poem into a first shining, Heidegger's concept of eloiterum does not, in principle, allow Heidegger to use the help of a second poem for elucidating the first one which does not mean the elucidation is wrong, but simply that it is doing something the very term elucidation cannot quite grasp. To put it schematically, given one, his adopting as his own, his description of Heidegger's Dimash, which he describes in passing as a writing extravagance, extravagance d'écriture, many Germans dismiss or ridicule the French for taking seriously, and the Derridans in this room will know that the Hidat does take it seriously and that a writing extravagance cannot possibly be all bad for the Hidat. And given, too, the Hidat's own erratic practice of reading poets like Malarmé, Ponge, or Celan in a manner not entirely dissimilar to the way Heidegger reads Traco, by jumping to and fro as though to follow a chain of metonymic associations, it cannot possibly be the case that the Hidat is simply against Heidegger's démarche a demash that he defines more vagabond, more vagabond and extra wagon than Heidegger is prepared to concede, and that his privileging of gathering is destined to repatriate towards a unified German home, the Ein of Trakow's Ein Geschlecht. Perhaps then, we should differentiate between how Heidegger says he reads Trakow and another gesture, according to which Heidegger does not quite know what he's doing, or at any rate seems unable to, to account for his own maneuvers of reading that do not comply with the distinctions Heidegger sets up, nor with the nationalistic conclusions he reaches. Something Heideggerian in Heidegger's text, something Heidegger himself might not have recognized, seems to be already doubling Heidegger so as to produce something not exactly like Heidegger, a fake copy that smuggles in a second Heidegger who would be able to read Taco and jump erratically about and around as much as he pleases, without pulling back when faced with a non-German stranger who has no fixed destination to make way towards, without regretting the strike, mark, or remark coming to cover over, coming to cover over or disfigure what Heidegger's official notion of Erleuterung claims to leave alone, intact, or naked, according to that first manner of letting a text appear, that we saw that he that briefly outlined. Over in the game switch, he opposed a, quote, writing intrusion or extravagance Heidegger perhaps unwittingly indulges in by letting his text slip into an autobiographical zone where he too signs his text and translates Taco already within German in what Dehida calls une sorte de va-et-vient traducteur, 
that will overprint Heidegger's signature and language onto the very taco poems he so desperately wants to leave untouched or simply let sing out of their own supposed un undisturbed and pristine tranquility in accordance with the phonocentrism of an of, in accordance with the phonocentrism quote of an uninterrupted tradition whereby listening and song are irreplaceable as Heidegger asks us not to think of his auto home as a substitute to the actual listening to Taco's poems, a listening Heidegger does not pretend to guide, but simply to render, in the best case scenario, quote, more question worthy. Over and against, or perhaps indissociably together with the Heidegger who officially claims to render our listening to Taco's poetry, quote, more reflective, as we catch sight of the pure, the limpid, and the clear, that's Lautre of each Taco poem and abstain from messing or tempering with it, we find, or Deida seems to have found, at any rate, another contraband, another contraband and much messier Heidegger, whose signature is, like a palimpsest, printed under or behind the official text, waiting for a counter-signature or a counter-impression that will press the repressed text into the open, quote, crossing the marks of multiple writings and languages, making repetition into overprinting, as the Ada says. Thanks. Thank you. I'd like to open the floor for questions. Yes. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Rodrigo, for this uh, rich talk. Um, I, I just uh, ask uh, um, one question uh, on an issue that I find uh, particularly interesting, and this is, I think you phrased it once, at how does, uh, how does Derrida wound Heidegger in this text? And I think that's uh, an interesting and important point, and it's a bit harder to see maybe in these texts than in other ones. So I'm, I'm particularly interested in that. And the way that I understood uh, you was uh, to say that in a certain uh, sense Derrida repeats Heidegger's mode of reading or his, his manner of reading and thereby opens up Heidegger's text. And I wanted to ask you if the hinge here is in fact um, the way that Heidegger is supposedly understanding Erörterung or if we could also phrase that differently. So the point is, is Derrida just pointing to a contrast between what Heidegger says he is doing and what he in fact is doing or can we also, on the level of what he is doing, uh, sort out a certain heterogeneity in, in Heidegger's movement? So, um, is, is Heidegger's text uh, heterogeneous just in the sense that he doesn't do what he says he's doing? Hmm. Or is, uh, is there heterogeneity also in the way he proceeds, actually? Or, or, or how, does, how does this opening up of, the, of, of Heidegger's text work uh, in, in the Geschlecht 3 in your mind? You said some things about it, but I just want to uh, um, concentrate on that on that uh, aspect where the contrast or where the heterogeneity actually is in Heidegger's text here. Uh, thanks, thanks for the difficult question. I think um, I think first one very I think difficult sentence in Geschlecht three is the one where he says, "I don't think this um, metonymic transition is wrong, but I'm saying that it can't be explained." He says, by this concept of eloiterum. Um, and it might seem, you know, on the first read, that he is chiding Heidegger for how dare you take one word in this poem and use that word from another poem and to talk about it. Um, but then he would be, you know, back to with the criticism of the traditional methodology that he so thoroughly dismantled. And he says, I'm not saying it's wrong, even though he calls it brutal and fast, this met metonymic transition. But he goes in the direction to say, maybe there's something Heidegger is doing that his own official term, Eloiterung, cannot account. And if that's true, then how are we going to describe what Heidegger is doing? And I think that is what leads the Heidegger to begin speaking of Heidegger's own signature. Because it turns out that when Heidegger speaks of Taco, he's actually signing or imprinting on Taco his mark. Or, if you like, he, instead of doing the Eloiterung that was going to do, that was going to show us a, each poem in their limpid, crystal clear, untouched aspect, 
we're sort of messing with it in the way that he is messing with Heidegger by pointing to how Heidegger is messing to, with Krakow without perhaps meaning to. That's not to say that Heidegger's signature is unproblematic. Precisely when taken to lead Heidegger to some nationalistic conclusions, Beta is very uncomfortable with. Um, but I think, you know, his hope is that if Heidegger read Geschlecht three, he couldn't simply smile in that ironic way. He would be, when, when pointed out, here Heidegger, here's how you're doubling what you're saying about Krakow, you are yourself saying. I think that his hope is that that would give him pause. But I'm not sure if, I, if, I, if I'm getting at the subtle difference you're pointing between these, between these two heterogeneous layers. We, we, could talk, we could talk more about that. David. Rodrigo, thank you very much for your paper. Um, I was very struck by an expression you used toward the end, the possibility of a messier Heidegger. And that's possible, but that's messianic. I love that. So I'm going to steal that and try to think about that. But there's also, there's a sense in which sometimes Derrida reads with a precision um, that seems to top Heidegger's precision. Precisely, for example, with uh, Abendländisches Lied, where the phrase Ein Geschlecht appears. Derrida writes on the board, Heidegger cites the first two lines, skips 21 lines, and then reads the final lines. And it's, all, it's about that double point, you know, the deux points, the colon in the first line, and then the colon at the end of the poem. And what Derrida indicates is that Heidegger makes no reference to the word prior to which the second colon immediately preceding the expression ein Geschlecht occurs. And that's the word die Liebende, the lovers. And this caused me to look through Heidegger's essays. The words die Liebenden never appear in Heidegger's essays on Trakl. They are omnipresent in Trakl's poetry. You can scarcely find a poem in which brother, sister, and the lovers don't appear. And so there are moments, astonishing moments, when Derrida, who doesn't feel particularly competent as a reader of Trago, he used to say that all the time, he felt it deeply. And yet precisely at the point where Heidegger claims to be paying closest attention and has to be picking up, you know, the importance of the Eingeschlecht, which stems from the lovers who raise their eyelids, Heidegger misses it. So in addition to a, a kind of messier Heidegger, what you have with Derrida is a Heidegger with greater precision. Yeah, I, don't, I don't know. Just with greater care to actually look at the words, to put it up on the board, to have his students actually try to follow the lines of the poem. And this, this was, uh, it's on page 143, 44 of, of, the, of the text. Uh, I find it one of the most uh, striking indications. So there is just this incredible, you, don't, you can't call it expertise, but just this, this eagle eye, you know, which is, which is extraordinary. So speaking of eye, or eyelids, uh, it's interesting because even when the eye is being a little imprecise, when, he, for example, what is it that he, that he thinks? That uh, we're talking about a lead, about a song, about yeah. a song, but it's actually about about the the eyelids, the eyelids. Yeah. Uh, about the eyelids. But that lead that he mentions then brings us back in, more explicitly to the question of Liba, as he slightly misreads that that passage. Precisely the Liba that Heidegger seems <laughs> unable to unable to account for. I guess I guess I am tempted to say. Um, not exactly in Heidegger's, in Heidegger's uh, defense, that at least the, eyelid, the eyelids he mentions, and in fact, that's what gets him to, right, to, start, to start talking about the incest between brother and sister. And then there's that interesting figure, figure of Myrtle in their eye widelids. Uh, of course, he doesn't 
he doesn't then give us anything like an explicit discussion of the lovers. Um, but he's trying to gather via this figure of the eyelids that I always found fascinating. And for him, it's enough to say there's myrtle on their eyelids. And he connects that myrtle to what he calls nuptial drooling. Um, Pahir. Data translates that as Pahir. And all of a sudden, he sees a, he sees a nuptial scene between brother and sister. Um, but then there's that other passage that uh, you rightly pointed out, how Heidegger seems to focus on how not we are on not so much how we're becoming lovers, but how we're leaving other uh, lovers b behind. The the others, lovers are the others. That's that the we yeah. No, I think yeah. I think there's an entirely different um, dimension of Tako's text that remains to to, to be open. I think uh, I wanted to mention it just because it's another kind of heterogeneity, right. and one that. I'm surprised when, you know, when someone whose native language, like mine, is not German, uh, is able to see something that Heidegger, so careful a reader, I mean, Heidegger was reading Trockel before the First World War, while Trockel was still alive. So it's not as though he's a sloppy reader. And yet, extraordinarily, Derrida has this gift to stay with the text and to see things that are explosively important. You know, you know, very, very important, and, and that's different. That's, that's something that Heidegger himself is. There are certain themes, and it's interesting that love, the magnetism of love, is a theme that Heidegger will never raise. Whereas emance, the emance, amour, uh, this is one of Derrida's gifts to see, and it's important for Trockel, for heaven's sakes. But thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Other questions? Andy? Uh, uh, thank you. I, you made a tremendous amount of sense of the text. And I don't know which of the two Heideggerian senses that means. But the, I, I was especially thinking about all the places in Derrida's corpus. They're immense, which begins with the reflection on the protocols of reading, what, what will follow. Um, and this is one of the only ones I could remember where the question of, of passive or docile commentary is indicated and ruled out. And I'm just wondering about this. Um, I mean, given all the, the questions that you're pointing out about the um, the, the, the collapse of distance between reader and text, reader and reader, reader and writer here. Um, passive and docile seem to be really relatively strong words here about what, you, what, what is not going to happen. Right, right. Do you, you have any thoughts about that? Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that provocative question. Um, Yes, um, although we can see who he is speaking to in that sense, right? Um, and in fact, many Derrida texts um, could be, as it were, accused of ad nauseum exegesis. Uh, why does it take him 80 pages to, make, to say what he has to say? Why does he have to quote Hegel, for instance, ad nauseum and explain and, make, and, and, co and comment where it's sometimes very hard to parse out what he's finally doing. Um, here's, here's the punchline. Yeah. I don't think Geshe has any punchlines. Uh, which means that your question, I think, stands. Then commentary, passive, I think there's something extremely, let's say, passive about it, in the sense that he's trying to let the text do something um, to itself, uh, to deconstruct itself, or at least he hopes to find the text deconstructed. But I guess that wouldn't um, that wouldn't really be that wouldn't really be a commentary in, in the status of simply writing on the margins, as it were. Or here to write on the margins means to completely refigure the text itself, right? But I think you were pointing to how 
it seems uh, it seems as though whatever he's going to do, given the given how difficult it is to sort out the authority of voices in the text, it can't simply be the case that he's going to do something other or opposite than a docile or passive, whatever it is. So, I mean, I completely agree. He doesn't simply have a voice saying, here's what I'm doing uh, over and against this, you know, Dumble Heidegger. Uh, but, but thanks. Thanks. I appreciate the question. Um, I think we have time for one more question. I'll give it to Alyssa. Thanks. Um, it's may, this may be a comment, but just want to pick up on, on what you said at the end about the fake Heidegger or the double Heidegger or the contraband. And I thought you were saying that Derrida is, as it were, that fake Heidegger, that in reading it, he's writing on Heidegger, he's imprinting, he's drawing out that Heidegger of Heidegger. Um, but as Andy was just mentioning, Geschlecht III, like all other Derrida texts, sort of communicates with all other Derrida texts. And one communication that I was interested in um, is that Derrida mentions the problem of Geschlecht in uh, La Fosse Monet and, and, and um, Given Time. And the problem of the strike is also, it's not just type, but isn't it also uh, minting, coining. And so the doubling that you were talking about is related to the doubling of coinage, of money, yeah. of money, and Derrida himself makes that link in relation to the fake coin in La Fosse Monet, which, as he put it, could either give rise to another generation. So if, uh, so the fake coin can either, will then go on to proliferate and either be the foundation of a new capital or a ruin. And so I was sort of interested, and of course La Fosse Monet is all about signature, right, and counterfeiting signature. Mm -hmm. So I was interested in the economic dimension or the coinage of this doubling technique and what that would, e what that would do to the notion of bringing something back home. I think we would have to go to La Coulabach for that and the notion of geprägt. Uh, it's true that the Schlag David can correct me if I'm wrong. I think it's true that one of the meanings of Schlagen is to mint. Yes. Yeah, yeah that's why. Sure. Derrida but, mentions it. But Hagen also has that, yeah. that meaning, perhaps in a more explicit way today. And Lacula Bach has written a lot on the on typography, of course, uh, especially as it comes up in Heidegger. I'd be very interested to go to La Fosse Monet and see how that might be related then to Donner le Tombe 2 which, exactly. as some of you know, is the second half of the, of the seminar from uh, which uh, La Fosse Monet was extracted, if I'm not mis misremembering. But it all comes back, I guess, to the question of the type, to the question of the trace, the question of the printing. And for him, that will amount to a certain thinking of, of writing that will, of course, imply repetition, uh, forgery, the possibility of going of going wrong, and it is that um, possibility that Heidegger at once recognizes, but as he says, regrets. So it's not as though Heidegger says the Geschlecht is incorruptible. Heidegger recognizes that it can be corrupted, but the problem is that Heidegger wishes it were not so. And he's trying to say, hang on, if it is corruptible, then how are we to think of this corruptibility of the possibility of forgery otherwise than simply opposing it to um, authenticity, something like that. Um, but thanks, thanks for the question. All right, so we'll, we'll break now uh, for a brief coffee break out, right out here, um, and we'll resume at five after.